Assalamu alaikum everyone. My name is Samar Mirza and I'm a second year medical student. Today we'll be discussing the male reproductive system, specifically the gross anatomy of it. Um, before I begin, I hope everyone's Ramadan is going well and I hope your exams preparation is also going well. So here are my contact details. If you have any questions at any point or any concerns, don't hesitate to contact me. So without further ado, let's begin. Here's our outline for today's PAL session. So we'll have an overview, a very brief one, over the general structures, and then we'll go into details for all of them. Then we'll discuss the clinical cases, which are very, very important, and then we'll come to some questions. So as I mentioned, the overview, um, this is very general. I will be going into details for all of these very soon. So starting off, as you can see, this X-shaped structure, this is our testes, right? And this is responsible majorly for sperm production. On top of the testes, you have something called the epididymis. And this has multiple parts. It has technically three parts, and I'll get into them in a bit. And then at some point, the epididymis becomes the vas deferens. Now, the function of these is essentially to transmit the produced sperms from here to the prostate and then to the urethra, so the overall end product of the semen ends up containing the sperm. And as you can see, the, the vas deferens travels along here, here, and then it enters into this triangular shaped structure. And this is our prostate. It's an inverted triangle. And this is good to know because you can see that this part here is the apex, and this here is the base of the prostate gland. And then you have the bladder on top of the prostate, and these are the ureters, as we know. And then you have the urethra. Now the urethra is traveling from the bladder through the prostate, and so part of it, the urethra, is here. And then part of it is here, and so on. One part is here as well. So the urethra is a continuous um, object, and it has multiple parts and different names for those parts. And then you also have the penis, obviously. And again, that also is made up of multiple components, and I'll get into them in a bit. And one last thing to know is that from around here, I would say, and include this is this structure, including the testes and the um, part of the epididymis, these are stored in something called the scrotum. Now, the scrotum is like a sack of skin, and it's outside the interior abdominal wall. And this is usually to provide a temperature for these sperms to um, grow in because they cannot grow in a temperature same as our body temperature, so they have to be outside of it. And that's what the scrotum does. This is, again, the same diagram, just labeled. Don't worry about the uh, labels that I haven't mentioned yet because I will definitely get into them, and then we can refer back to this diagram. So starting off with the testis. So the testis, um, as I mentioned, is responsible for sperm production. And the structures within it are also are going to refer to that. So starting from out to in, we'll start with the tunica albuginea. And this is this tough fibrous capsule, and it's on the outside. Now the tunica albuginea gives inner septes here. And all of these gray lines indicate those. And within each septa, you have lobules. So this is pink stuff, is the lobules. Within each lobule, you have something called the seminiferous tubules, which are these coil structures. And this is where spermatogenesis occurs. And now, these seminiferous tubules, which are in each and every lobule, sorry, are in each and every lobule, they will end up draining towards a structure around here, called the ready testes. And the ready testes is just a network which is connect it's just a network which connects um, all the tubules from all the different lobules and they all drain into it. And then from the ready testes, you have something called to these. These are called the efferent ductiles. And these are collecting the contents of the ready testes and they're moving them into the epididymis, as I pointed out in the other diagram. Again, the epididymis has parts. So this part of the epididymis is the head. 
around this part, you have the body. And then around this part, you have the tail. So head, body, and tail. And then around this point here, it starts to become the vast difference as it's going up, it's ascending. Now, you can also notice here you have the red is the artery. So it's going to the testes. So it's a testicular artery. And same for the veins. They're called testicular veins. Now, an important thing about the veins are they form something called a plexus. And you can see the connections here between the veins. They're forming a plexus known as the pampiniform plexus. So a question could come and they'd ask, um, what is the pampiniform plexus made of? So it's testicular veins, not any other vein. This is again, the same thing. Um, as you can see, um, I would like to again point out the ready testes, which are very important. They're also known th as the mediastinum testes. They're again collecting everything from the seminiferous tubules in each, every lobule, and then passing it on into the afferent ductules. And then we move on to certain features. Besides sperm production, we also have endocrine function. And we also know that because, as I mentioned, the testes has to be outside the it's out the outside the body. Sorry, in the scrotum, um, it's essentially formed in the posterior abdominal wall, and it's descending into the scrotum outside the body. Again, this is to provide a temperature which is suitable for the spermatogenesis to occur. And as the testes is forming and descending down, it's also carrying its vessels and the vas deferens down with it in a structure known as the spermatic cord. So now for this, we have to come back to embryology. And so um, we'll begin slowly, right? So around week 26, the testes start to descend downwards from the scrotum, uh, to the scr scrotum, sorry. So initially, um, we'll come to this diagram first. So here are our testes, all right? And this is our posterior abdominal wall. This is our interior abdominal wall. It's good to know these layers. So you know that you start off with the um, anterior rectus sheath, then the rectus abdominis, then the posterior rectus sheath, and then, very important, transversalis fascia first, and then the peritoneum second. And then outside of those, you have the testes around here, and then the posterior abdominal wall. So that's exactly what this entire slide is saying. So how the testes are going to move are, they're going to move down, and they essentially have to reach here. So this is our scrotum right here. So what they're moving through is the inguinal canal. And so we'll come here for that diagram. The inguinal canal, a little revision, have a deep inguinal ring and a superficial inguinal ring. The superficial is more towards the outside and deep is definitely more inside. So this is our deep inguinal ring and this is our superficial inguinal ring. We'll draw it here as well, just for clarity. So the testes has to move down and it will move through the inguinal ring and it'll move down in the inguinal canal, sorry, and it'll move down to the scrotum. To do this, it has the help of a structure called the gubernaculum. And the gubernaculum essentially is a structure and it's dragging down the testes and it's also marking the pathway that the testes has to follow as it moves down. Now in the end, the gubernaculum doesn't remain as such, like it doesn't remain as this structure, which is the gubernaculum, it ends up becoming something called the scrotal ligament. So this is our point of interest here. Um, they ask the origin of the scrotal ligament or what does the gubernaculum end up as? You should know that it's the scrotal ligament and so on. Now, as the testes is going down, it's dragging down part of the peritoneum with it. So these pink dotted lines mark the peritoneum, and it's also taking down part of the uh, transversalis fascia with it. So now what's becoming of those? The peritoneum, uh, as it's going down, it's being called the processus vaginalis. And then at some point, a lot of it disintegrates and it ends up being called the tunica vaginalis, the only part that remains. So again, this is very important. So this is mostly what remains of it. It's just an outer covering over one part of the testis. This has clinical significance, um, as do anything that have stars on them. These all have clinical significance and I will get to them later. 
Um, it also takes down, as I mentioned, the um, transversalis fascia with it. So just remember that. Now, um, as I mentioned, the testes are descending and they have to take down their vas deferens, their arteries, and their nerves down with it. So they take it down through the structure called the spermatic cord. Now the spermatic cord has four main components. Very nice to know all of them, they're pretty easy. And again, it's a very like, free mark type of question. So you have the vas deferens, which is a major part of the spermatic cord. It's again, transmitting these sperms to their designation. Then you have testicular artery and vein, and then you have the genital branch of the genitofemoral nerve, which is from the lumbar plexus. This is pretty simple to remember. We're talking about the genital area, so genital branch of the genitofemoral branch. And as I mentioned, the testes are passing through the um, inguinal canal, so the spermatic cord will also pass through the inguinal canal. Now, the spermatic cord has an interesting part, which is that it's developing many layers around it as it's going down the inguinal canal. So, as I mentioned, just like how the testes are dragging down some parts of them, so is the spermatic cord. So, um, we'll start off first. As it's moving down, it'll first take part of the transversalis fascia. So, we'll come to this diagram here. This is our transversalis fascia. This is our this is originally where our testes was. So the first thing which is facing it will definitely come down with it. So the transversalis fascia comes down. As the transversalis fascia comes down, it forms a band around the spermatic cord, which is again just this structure. These are called the spermatic cords together. It forms a band around it, and this is known as the internal spermatic fascia. Okay. So that's one component. After passing through the fascia trans transversalis, it passes through the internal oblique muscles. And as it goes through them, it carries down part of it and it gets a covering. And this is now called the cremastric fascia. And this is again derived from the internal oblique muscle. Lastly, it passes through the external oblique muscles and the aponeurosis, which are essentially also a type of connective tissue from those muscles. They also begin to surround the spermatic cord and they give rise to the external spermatic fascia. So it's this one here, this gray one. And together, these three layers end up forming the spermatic uh, cord, which contains these four structures. So again, um, we have three layers in the spermatic cord, the internal spermatic fascia, the cremastric fascia and the external spermatic fascia. These are derived again from fascia transversalis, internal oblique muscles and external oblique muscles. Um, in your lectures, there was a concern raised about what about the rectus abdominis muscle. It has no role around any of these. That's why the fascia of it isn't involved. This is according to Dr. Atif himself. So I think it's very important to make sure you know what the layers are and what they're derived from. Um, confusing these layers can just result in losing very, very simple marks. So try your best to make sure you memorize these. Um, this is the mnemonic, ICE. Um, it's in to out. So you have internal spermatic fascia, then chromastric fascia, and then external spermatic fascia, ICE. And that covers our embryo and our testes and our spermatic cord. Now we have the epididymis and the vas deferens. Now, as I mentioned, the epididymis is the coil structure on top of the testes, and they carry these sperms up to the um, prostate, and then from there through the urethra and down to its final destination in the semen, right? So it has the three components, the head, body, and tail. When it ascends up, it's known as the vas deferens. And then the vas deferens ends up passing through the superficial ring and the deep ring and the pelvic cavity, so essentially the inguinal canal. So it's passing through it. And then after passing through the inguinal canal, it joins with the seminal vesicle. Or technically, it joins with a duct that's coming from the seminal vesicle. So these two ducts join. So the vas deferens and the um, seminal vesicle duct, they join together and they form something called the ejaculatory duct. But before it joins the duct, it has a small swelling. And this is pretty important. Dr. Atif was stressing on it. 
And this small swelling is known as the ampulla of vas deferens. I think you might have heard the term ampulla elsewhere as well. It's, it usually occurs when a tube starts swelling up and then it opens into something. So if I were to draw the vas deferens, it's coming up like this. And say this, this is our um, seminal vesicle around, this is our prostate and this is our seminal vesicle around it. Um, ignore the really poor drawing, but it's coming here, right? And then we look at a posterior view of it. Um, this is our prostate and these are our seminal vesicles. The vas deferens is coming and it's the normal thin um, duct and then it thickens. And so this thickening is called the, or it thickens or it swells and the swelling is called the ampulla. And then the seminal vesicle has its own ducts and together they open into the prostate. You'll see a better diagram soon. Um, Yes, okay, this one. This is, this first diagram just shows the general pathway of the epididymis and the vas deferens. And then this shows the posterior view of the bladder and the prostate. So this is our ureter, that's one thing. And this tube here, this is our vas deferens. So it's coming down. And as you can see here, it starts swelling. And this is our ampulla. And then, the ampulla and the seminal vesicle duct combine, and this combination is known as the ejaculatory duct. And these open into the prostate gland, and then they move into the urethra, and they dispose of their contents in there. Now, that's us done with epididymis and vas deferens. Now we have the scrotum. As I mentioned, it's a sack of skin that contains the testes and also the spermatic cord with it. Now, this is a cross-section of it. As I mentioned, the spermatic cord has four contents, and one of them is a nerve. But you should note that the ilioinguinal nerve is not inside the spermatic cord. The nerve that is inside the spermatic cord is the genital femoral nerve and the genital branch of it specifically, but the ilioinguinal nerve is not inside the spermatic cord. It is outside of it. And these are just the multiple layers of the um, scrotum. So as I mentioned, you have um, external. So if we're going from out to in, it's going to be the reverse of ice. So E, C, I, right? So you have external spermatic fascia, then chromatic fascia, and then internal spermatic fascia. And we'll get into that diagram here. Starting with um, external, then chromatic. So here, here, and then internal right around here. Then you have, um, now, as I mentioned, Tunica vaginalis, it was initially processes vaginalis, and processes vaginalis was initially peritoneum, and the peritoneum was sending down with the testes. And so at some point, part of it disintegrated, and what you're left with is tunica vaginalis. Now, because it is still technically peritoneum, just like how peritoneum has two layers, the parietal and visceral, so does this. So you have parietal layer of tunica vaginalis, and then visceral layer of tunica vaginalis, and these just cover the testes, the part of it. Then um, another fascia that you need to know, and we'll get into these in a bit. So we have the superficial, um, the last layer, the outermost, is the superficial fascia, also known as darchos fascia. So again, you have the superficial fascia, the darchos fascia, then ice, but backwards. Then you have the, um, the original contents of the scrotum, so the spermatic cord and the testes. And then over the testes, you obviously have the tunica vaginalis. And above the testes, you have the epididymis. And then we can move on to another diagram. Again, all of these pictures are just from their slides. Um, so these are just the same um, exact things that we mentioned before. So we can go over them again. So we have the superficial fascia of Darito. So we have the external spermatic fascia, the chromastric fascia. And then you have the um, internal spermatic fascia, which is shown here instead. And then you have the spermatic cord contents, right? So pampiniform plexus is one of them. Um, I don't think I can see the others here in any way. Anyway, then you have the testes and the epididymis on top of them, obviously. Other contents of the spermatic cord, remember, are the testicular artery and the um, genital branch, the genital femoral nerve. And again, this has a star next to it because it is of clinical importance and we'll come to it in a bit.
then we have the urethra. Now the urethra has multiple parts, but um, I personally think this is the more interesting part, so let's get into it. So we have a pre-prostatic urethra, and as the name suggests, pre-prostatic means it's the part of the urethra that's above the prostate. So mostly that's the starting point that's just originating from the bladder. Then you have the prostatic urethra, and this part over here um, is the most dilated, and it also has other components inside it known as the prostatic utricle, the prostatic duct itself, and the ejaculatory duct. Now remember that the ejaculatory duct was made up of the seminal vesicle duct, as well as the ampulla of the vas deferens. And it also has something called barium or seminal colliculus, and we'll get into why this is important as well. So preprostatic done, prostatic done. Then you have the membranous urethra, and make no doubt that this is the most delicate part of the urethra. Although another part can get injured as well, and we'll get into it, this is the most delicate part. And if a question comes, they ask what is the most delicate part of the urethra, no other um, details, then it is the membranous urethra. After that, we have the spongy urethra, and that is made up of two components, or it develops into two components. One part of it is called the bulbar urethra, and the other part of it is called the penile urethra. Now, both membranous urethra and bulbar urethra can get injured in different circumstances, and we'll get into them as well. Then, um, as the spongy urethra ends, at the penile urethra, you have the navicular fossa and then the external meatus. Meatus is just another word for an opening, so external meatus is the opening of the urethra at the end of the penis. Other parts of the urethra that are important to know are curvatures. So it is curving because it is a long tube and we have a lot of structures in the male reproductive system. So it has two main curvatures to note of. So when you're turning from membranous to bulbar, that's one. And when you're turning from bulbar to penile, so these are our two cur curvatures that we have. As it is the urethra, we also have two sphincters, internal and external. So you now this is a diagram for it. Just to orient yourself, remember this is anterior and this is posterior. So starting off with our urinary bladder, you can see the pre-prostatic part right above the prostate. Then you can see the prostatic part here, and you can notice that this is the most dilated part. It has um, swelling, or it's greater in size or diameter than the other parts of the urethra. Then you have the membranous urethra, and that's the part that's by the muscle. So this um, dotted line area is a muscle, and it's technically the, um, it also gives rise to the internal sphincter, but we'll get into that too. But here you have the muscle giving rise to the internal sphincter, and right by it you have the membranous part of the urethra, which is again the most delicate part. Then you can see that this entire thing, so from here to here, this um, part that I struck um, circled, this entire thing is the spongy urethra. So it has a horizontal part and it has a vertical part. So the horizontal part is known as the bulbar urethra. And you can tell that this is the bulbar urethra because it's by a structure known as the bulb of the penis. So this part that I've colored red, this is the bulb of the penis. So the part of the urethra that's in line with it is known as the bulbar urethra. Then the remaining part, which is horizontal, which is vertical, sorry, um, as it's for the shaft of the penis, this part is going to be called the penile urethra. These are our main parts. Then you have the navicular fossa, which is it's slightly dilating as it's going toward the end of its tract, and then the external urethral orifice, or meatus, both which just mean opening. Um, okay. So for the prostatic urethra, as I mentioned, we have some important parts that we need to know of. So you have the prostatic ure utricle, and you'll learn about this in lab, or you should have already. Um, it's essentially an embryological remnant, um, and there's no further details that you need to know about it in this lecture specifically. Um, I'm not sure if your lab requires more. 
Um, and then you have something called the seminal, oh, sorry, the seminal colliculus or the very montanum. And it's essentially a swelling of what is originally the urethral crest. So the urethral crest is when the um, urethra starts to enter the prostatic urethra and starts to swell up. The part of it that's more swollen up, seminal colliculus, is the very montanum. Now, Dr. Atif stressed that this is an important landmark when you're dissecting in a surgery, for example, because if you cross this, then you can risk damaging um, any, you can risk damaging this muscle here. So um, say that you accidentally dissected through it and you miss this landmark, damaging this uh, muscle over here would result in um, what's it called, dribbling of a urine. And that reminds me, I'm sorry, I meant to say over here, external sphincter and not internal. So this thing here at the bottom of the prostate, bottom of the prostate is external, above the prostate is internal. So we'll get back to that again, but just to clarify. Here, so you would say here it was our bladder initially, this is our prostate. Between the bladder and the prostate, you have the internal urethral sphincter, so I, very important. Then it goes down, and you have the urethral crust, you have the seminal colliculus. You're going down, you have now openings of the ejaculatory duct. She mentioned were derived from the seminal vesicle and the um, ampulla of the vas deferens, their ducts combining, and they open into the prostate gland. Then you also have the prostate gland itself giving its um, deliveries into the urethra. So these uh, openings, multiple of them, are prostatic sinuses or um, openings of prostatic sinuses into the main um, urethra. And then it's traveling down. And then you have the external urethral sphincter. So just to recap, we'll write it here. Internal is between the bladder and the prostate, well, external is between the prostate and the membranous part um, of the urethra. So again, very important, just remember these because again, they can ask about these. Um, remember when it's internal, and in any case, a sphincter that's internal is most likely um, autonomous, so involuntary, so you can't control it. And it's also made up of smooth muscle. That's why you can't control it because it's under autonomic control. As for external sphincters, these are skeletal, skeletal muscles. Their supply is from the peripheral spinal nerves and these are under our control. And moving on, this is again the same thing. Here we have our very important bulbourethral glands, also known as Calvary's glands. So here, um, we'll start from the top and we'll come down. So again, we have our bladder and we have our trigone here. We're coming down. Here is our internal urethral sphincter, very important. As it enters, we have the urethral crest, the seminal colliculus, and then the opening, et cetera. It's going down. This is our prostate, uh, prostatic urethra. As it's coming down, we now have our external urethral sphincter right here, these two. And beside the external urethral sphincter, we have the two bulbourethral glands. So they're bilateral, they're on both sides. And then these combine with the membranous part of the urethra. So they're joining at the membranous part. And here they, um, they open into it. And their function is essentially to lubricate the urethra and their secretions are what give rise to something known as the pre-ejaculation or pre-ejaculatory fluid. So this is fluid that's separate from the ejaculatory fluid, which contains semen. This is not that, this is different. This is mostly for lubrication. Um, now the bulbourethral uh, urethral glands also have a homologous structure in the females, and that is known as the Bartholin's glands. And that covers the urethra, yes. And then you move on to the prostate. Again, a very important um, structure. It can have um, a lot of questions asked. So as I mentioned, the prostate is this triangular structure, right? And the top part is called the base. 
and then the bottom part is called the apex. And now it has multiple surfaces. So the anterior surface has its relations as does the posterior as does the inferior lateral. So the anterior surface is related to the pubal prostatic ligaments. So um, let me see if I can get you. Okay, wait. Um, for a side diagram here, as you can see. Um, let me. One second. Yes. Okay. So, um, if you start from here, you notice this. This is our pubic symphysis. From here to the prostate here, you will have a ligament or a relation formed from the pubo-prostatic ligaments, pubo from pubic symphysis and prostatic from prostate to pubo-prostatic pubo ligaments. That's one where the anterior relation of the prostate, as this is again, anterior and posterior. Then um, you again have the pubic symphysis ahead of it. And then you have the retropubic space. And the retropubic space is again, um, retro means behind. So behind the pubic uh, symphysis, there's a space known as the cave of Fretzius. This is mostly just, um, the way you need to know this is just to know the layers. So they might state an order of certain structures. So you need to know what's anterior, what comes first, what comes second, and so on. Albeit it's not in a lot of detail, and the questions would be very simple, in my opinion, for this type of structure. Then posteriorly, you have the rectal vesicle fascia. So this is our rectum over here. So between the rectum and the prostate, you have the rectal vesicle fascia. So that's one relation on the posterior surface. And then you have the ejaculatory ducts on the posterior surface of the area, there, as we know, from the seminal vesicle and the ampulla of the epididymis. Interolaterally, so below the prostate and on the sides of it, you have the pubourethralis part of the levator ani, or levator ani. So these are the muscles um, that are forming the pelvic floor. So um, a certain part of them, the pubourethralis, um, they are covering uh, the prostate from the inferior lateral aspects. Now, the function of the prostate is that it contributes to about 20% of the ejaculatory volume. So um, it's releasing certain liquids that are increasing the volume of the semen, to, and they're um, doing this by about 20%. And um, later on, once the semen is um, ejaculated into the vagina, this uh, the secretions of the prostate help um, like liquefy the semen once it's entering the vagina. So having entered, they might coagulate. So um, the thin alkaline fluid that is produced by the um, prostate ends up liquefying it and making it, you know, uncoagulated. Then the prostate also has two um, coverings and these together form a capsule. Um, as with a lot of structures that we know, there's a false capsule and a true one. So the true one is a fibrous sheath, while the false one is derived from um, fascia, extraperitoneal fascia. It's not a covering that was developed on its own for the prostate. Now, this extraperitoneal fascia do, um, joins with the bladder's fascia, and then this joins with the fascia of Dinon Villiers. Um, again, this is just an order that you should know. Now, between these two layers um, of the capsule, you have the prostatic venous plexus. And so when you are, say, um, doing a surgery on the prostate, as Dr. Arthur has mentioned, being careful of this uh, venous plexus is important. Otherwise, it could lead to a severe bleeding. And this plexus also has a further clinical importance later on, and I will get into it in a bit. Again, this is just the same structure. This is our prostate. This is the posterior aspect of it. Now this is a cut section. This is anterior and this is posterior. And this is just to help you see further. This is our recto vesicle fascia over here, um, this area, and this is our rectum. Um, this is the uh, puborurethralis part of the levator ani muscle that we were talking about that's covering it inferiorly and laterally. Um, and this is again, our pubic symphysis. 
and these are again the openings of the prostate gland. This over here is our urethra. Again, remember that the um, prostatic urethra is the most dilated part of the urethra, so this is the largest opening you would see for it. And these two openings here are for the ejaculatory ducts, which are two, one and two. Now the prostate has um, two sorts of divisions. Um, you can either divide it anatomically or um, based on like clinical or functional zones. So starting with anatomically, anatomical divisions were created based on structures that are passing through the prostate gland itself. So here you have the bladder and from the bladder you have the urethra passing through. So the structures in front of the urethra are then classified as interior lobe while the structures behind the urethra have two further divisions. So you have our ejaculatory duct passing through and entering into the urethra. So the structure above the ejaculatory duct is known as the median lobe, and the structure below the ejaculatory duct is known as the posterior lobe. And you can say below, or I mean, I think up and down is the easiest way to classify, so you can remember it this way. Um, and then you have two lateral divisions, which are shown here. So this is another cut section, and this is a different cut section. So here you can see the two lateral lobes. These are again based on the urethra passing through. Um, and that covers it for anatomical no uh, lobes. Um, I will be getting into the clinical again for all of these, but just for now, immediately know that median lobe is associated with BP, um, BPH, which is by, um, by nine prostatic hyperplasia. This is very important. Median lobe is associated with benign prostatic um, hyperplasia. Then you have the three clinical or functional zones. This is the transitional zone, and then the peripheral zone, and then the central zone. Okay. Um, so this is a diagram to show it. Um, so we can start with this one here. Um, so the part that's covering the urethra or like um, sandwiching the urethra, so these green ones, um, this and this, these are our transitional zones. And then the part that's this blue one, which is just encircling the entire thing here, as you can see here, it's the peripheral zone. You can kind of see that it's covering the periphery of the prostate in general, so it's the peripheral zone. And then on the back side over here, you have um, the central zone. And the thing is, you can see that it's um, it's pretty centered. It's more towards the center of the prostate. So a lot of these names are pretty like general. Transitional, again, it's important to know that it's sandwiching the urethra or it's completely encircling it. Um, peripheral zones are again this part over here, the blue ones, and then the central zones are covering sort of the back side of the um, prostate, but also they're again on the center of it. More views of it here. You can see this again is our transitional zone, so T. Um, the purple is again our central zone, and it's covering the center part of it and also like more on the posterior aspect, but towards the top. And then the remaining here from the sides and everything of the um, uh, prostate is the peripheral zone. These are again, just different cuts to show it. This cut is pretty important to know as well as this one. Um, and this is another thing that is um, a very nice diagram, I would say. Uh, as you can see the transitional zone again, I'm um, encapsulating the urethra. Then you have the central zone um, you would say somewhat on the posterior aspects of it, and then the peripheral zone covering the remaining, and then you have the interior stroma on top at the most front. Now for these, again, transitional zone is most important for BPH. So by benign prostatic hyperplasia would occur in the transitional zone. With that said, um, malignant tumors or cancers would mostly occur in the peripheral zone. So 70 to 80% of them would occur here. 
20% of them can occur in the transitional zone as well. So again, just to summarize, BPH is in the median lobe, we'll be careful not to say median zone, and transitional um, zone. As for tumors or cancers specifically, um, these are mostly in the uh, peripheral zone and then partly in the transitional zone. I hope that makes it clear. Um, and another thing to note about the central zone is that, um, as you can see, the part of the prostate that's being covered by the central zone includes the ejaculatory ducts. This could again be a question opportunity. So if they ask um, which zone contains the ejaculatory ducts or something along the lines of that, it's the central zone. Which zone encapsulates the uh, urethra or circles it, that's the transitional zone. And the remaining periphery is again, the peripheral zone. Um, and for the, um, what's it called for BPH? Again, remember median zone, median low, sorry, and transitional zone. And then we move on further to the perineum. And a perineum is, perineum is pretty simple for the males. And I think you have another lecture covering this, but essentially it's this diamond shaped structure, as you can see. And then you divided the diamond into two main triangles. One triangle is called the urogenital triangle, while the other triangle is called the anal triangle. As it may suggest, the anal triangle contains the anus, while the urogenital um, triangle contains genitals, specifically the, um, uh, what's it called, the penis and, the, and such. But now what we need to know for this lecture, at least, about the perineum is the boundaries of it in the male reproductive system. That's what's important for this lecture. So laterally, you have the ischiopubic rami, and they're forming the lateral border of this triangle, as you can see. Um, then posteriorly, so this line over here, as they're moving, they're moving actually posteriorly based on the angle of the person sitting. So posteriorly, um, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, this is the lateral borders. This is our posterior border. So based on the angle the person is sitting in, this line is technically moving posteriorly. And this line is made up of um, an imaginary connection line between this tuberosity and this tuberosity. So this is our posterior um, line. And then anteriorly, so the part that is more on the front, you have um, this. So this part over here. And this is made from the inferior margin of the pubic symphysis. So this is our pubic symphysis here. So below it, you would have the anterior boundary. So again, laterally, you have the ischiopubic rami. Posteriorly, you have the um, imaginary connection between the two uh, tuberosities. And then anteriorly, you have the um, inferior margin of the pubic symphysis. And together, they give you the points to make the triangle. As for the anal triangle, just know that they're moving from, again, the ischial tuberosities. And they're moving down towards the coccyx bone, towards the tip of it. And that's it for perineum. Then you have the pelvis. Now, something that Dr. Um, Atif stressed upon in your lecture was that you need to know that the muscles that are making up the floor or the diaphragm of the pelvis cannot be the same muscles that make up the wall. So there are two different muscles, um, two different groups, you could say. A muscle that's making up the pelvic wall will not make up the pelvic diaphragm. That's a general idea. So muscles that are making up the pelvic diaphragm or the pelvic floor are the levator ani muscles, and they have their three parts, so pubal coccygeus, puborectalis, and iliococcygeus, and then, so that's one, and then two, the other muscle that's making up the pelvic floor is the coccygeus muscle. So you can come here, and you'll notice um, pubal coccygeus is a muscle that's going from the pubic symphysis all the way to the coccyx bone, so that's this one over here. Um, so this one over here is our pubal coccygeus. Then you have puborectalis. So this is our rectal opening here. 
So going from the pubic symphysis to the erectile opening is our pubo rectalis. Then you have the iliococcygeus, as the name suggests. It's going from the um, iliac crest down to the cox coccyx bone. So that's this one over here. Um, and then you also have the coccygeus muscle, taking up the pelvic diaphragm. So levate your ani muscles and coccygeus muscle. As for the pelvic wall, it's made up by the obturator internus and its fascia. And its fascia is known as the tendinous arc of levator and So um, this here, this is our obturator internus. And this green thick band is the tendinous um, arc over here. And as you can see, it's in the shape of an arc, that's why. And then last, um, the piriformis muscle. So the piriformis muscle is this one. Um, and this is making up, again, the pelvic wall and not the pelvic diaphragm. And then, again, recall that this is the urethral opening over here in this, in this area, and this is our rectal opening over here. Um, then we move on to the external genitalia. So um, this one contains essentially the penis and its multiple parts. So you would start with the bulb of the penis. Then the crura, individually, they're known as crus. Then you have something called the corpora cavernosa and something called the corpora spongiosa. And to not be confused between them, we'll come to the next slide in a bit. Then again, as I mentioned before, same thing from urethra, you have the navicular fossa and the external urethral meatus. So if we come here, we'll start with this. This is our bulb of the penis. And these are the openings of the bulbourethral gland, gland here. This, as I mentioned, the bulbourethral glands in the part of the urethra or the prostate as well, these are opening into the membranous part of the urethra. And then you continue to go down. You're forming the, um, the bulbar part. Uh, from, you're forming the spongy part, which has the bulbar part and the penile part. So technically, again, this is our bulbar part, and this is our um, penile part of the urethra, and this is that traveling down. Now surrounding it, this pink stuff, like right on top, um, or right around the urethra itself, immediately afterwards, you have the corpora spongiosum, so right around it. And then outside of that, from this, um, I guess it's technically this over here, this um, line, um, this angled line, and then that goes vertically. This one is the corpora cavernosa. Now to remember this, one thing you can remember, this part overall of the urethra, as we know, is known as the spongy urethra. So corpora spongiosum would be something that's right around it. As for corpora cavernosa, Corpora cavernosa is a piece of erectile tissue. So what that means is um, when there's increased blood flow to the penis, especially the ca uh, corpus cavernosa, um, it will fill up and it will start to um, erect. So Dr. Atif said an analogy of a cave, corpus cavernosa, so cave here. And you can see um, here, so like this is our cave. Once it fills with water, it starts to expand, right? And then as you come here, this is the normal resting state of it. And once it's full up, uh, filled up with blood or water in this case, it starts to erect and move up. Again, corpus cavernosum or corpus cavernosum. And then at the end of the penis, you have the glans penis. There is no specific way to memorize this. This is just how it ends, glans penis. And here you have the bulb of the penis again. So where it's starting, it's the bulb. Where it's ending, it's the glands. Again, remember our bulbourethral glands over here. And the other structures, as you can see, just to revise, um, here it was our vas deferens. And as it was coming down, it was swelling. It became the ampulla. Combined with seminal vesicle, gave rise to the ejaculatory ducts. 
they enter the prostate, the prostatic uh, urethra pass through, becomes the membranous urethra. Membranous urethra becomes spongy, spongy specifically bulbar here, and then um, penile here. Oh, sorry. Um, and then we move on to the, um, let me move on to the cross sections. So he wanted you to appreciate the difference when you cut the um, penis at different points. So here you're cutting it at the body. So what that means is you are cutting it, sorry, right around like here. Okay, like around the main section of the penis. That's the first diagram. So you can notice that here is our urethral opening, this slightly pink line over here. And then right around it, this blue structure, because again, it's a spongy urethra, you would have the corpus spongiosum. Then on top of it, these two large um, structures, they are the corpus cavernosum. Again, these are the um, erectile tissues. Versus this opening here, which is this cross section, sorry, here, this is cut more like upwards, more towards where you would still have the um, levator ani showing, so a little more upwards. And this cut, again, all he wants you to notice, again, this is our urethra. It's a, a slightly wider opening because you're more closer to the um, uh, a prostate, a prostatic part um, and the membranous part. And then what's surrounding it is, again, the corpus spongiosum. And then you can see the beginnings of the corpus cavernosum. Um, the hamster is here because the this diagram here resembles them a lot. So Resemble, remember the hamster, remember this diagram, and remember that this is the body of the penis. As for blood supply and nerves, um, so I just summarized it into one table. So we'll start with this um, because there are some important points here. For the testes and scrotum, so because they go together, they're right next to each other, they're, they're going to have identical uh, supplies. Now, the right testicular vein is going to drain immediately into the inferior vena cava. But the left testicular vein is going to take the longer route. So left, L, longer, L. It's going to move through the left renal vein first and then the inferior vena cava. Now, these veins are important. Remember that they are forming the pempiniform plexus, but also remember that um, these are supplying the testes and the scrotum. In the condition of varicose veins, where essentially there's um, some sort of blockage to these veins, causing them to dilate to allow more blood flow to occur, you have um, this baggy um, bag of worm appearance. Sorry, so the veins are engorged and they're dilated. Now, this is to again allow more blood flow to pass through, and as more blood is passing through, it's increasing the temperature inside the testes and the scrotum because blood carries heat. So you end up forming something called varicocele. And so these um, end up leading to infertility if not resolved, because again, those higher temperatures are not suitable for spermatogenesis. Now, they're more likely, or they're more seen at least, in the left testicular vein area than the right, because the angle of drainage for the left is um, it's greater. And as well as there's more chances of obstructions from tumors or aneurysms occurring on the site again because it's taking the longer route. So say an aneurysm of the lower part of the abdominal aorta, it would compress the left renal vein or obstruct it, leading to enlargement of the IVCs to allow more blood to uh, enlargement of these already left um, testicular veins to allow more blood to pass through, again leading to varicose veins or var and then varicose veins end up becoming something called a varicocele. Um, we do have a picture of it right around here. So internally, you can see that they look really um, dilated, engorged, and even externally, you can see it here. It looks, um, again, really, really um, engorged, and it's very visible. It's easy to tell. The person who has this would complain of like something dragging him down on the side where they have the varicose seal. So when they're walking or when they're standing for a long period of time, they would feel like there's a dragging sensation on the side of the body that contains the varicose seal. So that's veins done. Arteries are pretty simple. They are the testicular arteries. They're derived from the aorta, where the testes and scrotum. 
And remember the rule that lymphatics always follow the arteries. So if they're coming from the aorta, the lymphatic nodes that are supplying the testes and the scrotums are going to be the para-aortic lymph nodes. These are both occurring at the levels of L1 and L2. It's good to know the levels, so just um, if you have time, try to memorize them. As for the prostate, now the prostate is supplied from the prostatic branch of the inferior vesicle artery. And the inferior vesicle artery is derived from the internal iliac vein. So this is our main guy over here. So you have internal iliac giving rise to inferior vesicle, giving rise to the prostatic branch. Other branches would supply it are middle rectal. So you can remember this by the prostate being very near to the rectum, so middle rectal and inferior pudendal. I'm sure the pudendal nerve and pudendal vessels are going to follow you around for the remaining of this block. Anyway, then you have something called the prostatic venous plexus. Remember I mentioned that these lie between the two layers of the capsule. Now, um, damage to them again leads to devastating bleed, as well as something from this prostatic venous plexus that's important is cancer spread. So this venous plexus is connected to other plexuses. So they're connected to the vesicle plexus, the rectal plexus, and the vertebral plexus. So cancer, especially the prostatic cancer, can spread through blood very easily through this plexus. And so say they go to the vertebral plexus, for example, they spread there, a patient might present with back pain. And um, uh, once you do a scan, you can probably see that they have a metastasis of the cancer on that side. Then, so we have um, veins done and arteries done here. Next, we have the, uh, this is supposed to be artery, sorry. Yes. Next, we have the lymph nodes. So remember, I said internal iliac artery. So again, lymph nodes follow the arteries. So internal iliac nodes. That's our main guy over here for prostate. Furtherly, they would further they would probably have some external iliac nodes and some sacral nodes, but our main guy is the internal iliac node. Then as for nerves, you have something called the inferior hypogastric plexus of nerves. This is applying the prostate. So um, it has both sympathetic and parasympathetic supplies. So the sympathetic supply is giving you ejaculation. That's what results in ejaculation, while the parasympathetic supply is resulting in acid or secretion. Remember that the prostate is still a gland, so the um, secretions of it are being stimulated of, by acid or by the parasympathetic system. Parasympathetic system is responsible for the secretion of almost every single gland that you have, except salivary glands. So again, you have the parasympathetic secretion, um, parasympathetic innervation leading to acinar secretion and sympathetic um, innervation leading to ejaculation. Um, again, I was just, just making sure that you memorize this. Um, and another concern that usually people have is, oh, lymphatics are probably more likely to lead to um, um, cancer spread. In the case of prostate, it's not the same because, again, for the prostate, the major concern of spreading cancer is through the uh, prost prostatic venous plexus. There, and also just to note that the internal iliac nodes, they're not responsible directly for the tissue itself of the prostate. Um, they're, again, just responsible for the capsule on top of the prostate and not the tissue itself. They're only draining that capsule and the um, lymph, lymph there. They're not involved with the tissue itself because they're, again, on the superficial side of it. As for the venous plexus, they're going deep into the tissue, they're supplying it, and so on and so forth. So the cancer spread is most likely from the prostatic venous plexus. Very important to remember this. Um, and then we come into some of our clinical cases. Remember varicoceles, we discussed them. They have a dragging sensation and they have... Um, once the doctor like examines them, they'll notice that the um, appearance looks like a bag of worms. And it feels like that too. Um, and you should usually they have to correct it by surgery to restore fertility because again, this is not suitable for spermatogenesis. Then if you notice, I had put a star on the embryology part of what we were discussing in this pal. So that's undescended testis. 
um, in the case that the testes don't descend. So they can be um, uh, in any way, in their, anywhere in their pathway of descent, but they haven't fully come down. So this could be because, um, say that the um, hormones that were supplying, uh, that were controlling this descent are arrested or they're decreased. This would lead to the descent not being completed. So in undescended testes, in their original pathway. So that would be, let's see if I can show you. Um, second. Um, for the undescended testes, you would notice that this is our pathway, right? This is our pathway. And for this, this entire pathway down here, um, anyway, from here to the part of the scrotum, this is where the undescended testes would end up residing in. So they would, um, they could be here, they could be in the inguinal ring itself, in the inguinal canal, sorry. They could be by the posterior abdominal wall. They would be in its pathway, in its original pathway. They just haven't descended fully. So that's what um, undescended testes does, right? Um, back to our slide. Um, that's in their original pathway. And again, because they're not in the right position, there's they have to be outside of the body in the scrotal sacs, which provide the right temperature. If they're not there, then there's higher incidence of infertility because again, spermatogenesis cannot occur. Again, what doctors tend to do for this is they relocate the testes back to their um, normal position. And this is again, should be done pretty fast to reduce the risk of infertility as well as reducing the risk of malignancy because it's not in the right position and anything abnormal can lead to as such. Then you have something called ectopic testes. Now ectopic is a term you, um, used to refer to something that's not in its normal position at all. So it's not gonna be in the normal descent pathway. It's gonna be outside of it. It's gonna be in a random place that's not the right place for it. So for this, again, you need to intervene surgically and relocate them to their normal position. So um, what I want to mention for the normal pathway is that the normal pathway includes the inguinal canal. As I mentioned, the normal locations for the descent pathway are the inguinal canal, the, um, uh, what's it called? The, around the posterior abdominal wall in its original setting. Other locations for this might include the, um, one second, I'm so sorry. Other locations for this might include the um, uh, specifically just the superficial inguinal ring, maybe, or the deep inguinal ring, maybe the anterior abdominal wall between the superficial ring and the scrotum. So there's multiple locations. I would just suggest making sure you know them. Um, as for uh, certain information that you do, do have to know, if it's in the inguinal canal, If it's in the inguinal canal, this is going to lead to the presentation of, um, what's it called? Indirect inguinal hernia. So um, it, as you know, when structures pass through the inguinal canal that are not supposed to pass through there, it's a type of hernia. When it's passing through the inguinal canal, when it's a testes, these are going to result in an indirect inguinal hernia. And you've probably done this in GIT. Another thing to note is when, um, say that it's passing through the superficial ring, this is the most common presentation. This is what occurs most usually. Moving forward, we have the, uh, we have something called the hydrocele. So don't confuse this with the varicocele. A hydrocele is essentially a situation where, remember that we have the testes and we have a covering of the peritoneum and this was the tunica vaginalis. Uh, if there's accumulation of fluid in the tunica vaginalis, this would lead to something called hydrocele. And that's it, you just have to know this. So the question about this would just be, did they notice swelling and they notice fluid in the tunica vaginalis? And then what is it? Is it a hydrocele or a varicocele? Now urethral injuries. Remember that I mentioned that the membranous part of the urethra is the most um, delicate part. Note that the um, injury to the membranous part of the urethra is usually caused through an instrument. So say they were putting a catheter through. So instrumental refers to like a catheter 
um, going in to the urethra and that's um, hitting the membranous part of the urethra. And then again, this can damage that because it's very delicate. As for stridal injury, stridal injury, you can tell from the name, it's when a person is sitting in say a straddle position so when you're sitting on a motorbike or uh, a horse for example you, the way you're sitting the position you're in this can put you at risk of developing straddle injury in case of trauma or like high force and this straddle injury will lead to damage of the bulbar part of the spongy part of the urethra and then you have benign prostatic hyperplasia we covered that it occurs in the median lobe and the transitional zone but what is it so part of the prostate gland is enlarging, and this is benign. It's not cancerous. It's not malignant, but it's um it's enlarging. It results in something called lower urinary tract symptoms or LUTs. So um here this is the best diagram to represent it. As you can see, it's enlarging. This was our original prostate gland here, and it enlarged and it starts protruding into the bladder cavity, right? So that's one thing that it's doing. As it's doing this, as it's enlarging, it's leading to multiple um, effects. One of them, he called it the ball valve effect. And that's essentially, um, it's moving into the bladder and it's also covering up this opening over here. It's covering it in a way that's making it narrower. So it's making it harder for urine to pass through completely. Another thing it's doing, is the original urethral opening that's in the prostate itself. So the prostatic urethra, it's also narrowing that over here. And eventually, like because it is progressive, what it ends up doing is, um, technically it's here, yeah. So what it ends up doing is in progressive, um, in its progression, it ends up uh, causing such severe narrowing that it's um, obstructing urinary out outflow to a great extent. So they're, they're not fully able to urinate completely. As they're not urinating completely because it cannot pass through, so what they would feel is they would feel like they have a weak stream of urine, and they would also feel like um, when they go to the bathroom, they can't pee fully. And so as the urine is accumulating, it's going to accumulate here. So sorry, this is the trigone of the bladder around this area, so it's accumulating here. As it's accumulating, it's stimulating the um, the bladder. It's making it feel like uh, they have to pee, that they have a, uh, they have a full bladder, maybe they're, they're feeling that way, they need to pee, they have that um, urgency, as in they can't control it. So, um, and they also have increased frequency, meaning they have to go to the bathroom a lot. So they're constantly being stimulated that um, they have pee that they need to get rid of, but they, again, as you know, they can't um, completely pee because of the, um, uh, what's it called, the obstruction and the narrowing, um, but they have that feeling, they have that urgency, and uh, in older people, they have, like, severe nocturia, which is they wake up at night to go to the bathroom. Um, for the ball valve effect, it's, again, um, it's just here, it's covering, it's um, protruding into the bladder, so it's um, essentially preventing full flow, um, what it's doing is then um, a person might put um, more pressure as they're trying to urinate, and this pressure would just lead to um, like worsening in this case, not leading it to be better. That's an effect of the ball valve effect. Another thing to note is you can see these dotted lines. Again, these are to represent the sphincters. If you may remember correctly, this is the internal urethral sphincter as it's between the bladder and the prostate. Now, as you can see that this one is distorted. If it's distorted, it means it's not allowing proper control of urine. If it's not allowing proper control of urine, you would notice something called dribbling or urinary incontinence because the sphincter has been damaged, it's distorted, and there is no proper flow. So again, you have the ball valve effect where it's protruding into the bladder. You have the weak urine stream, and this is related to the progression of urinary um, progression um, of obstruction of urinary outflow. So weak urine stream, and then you have urinary incontinence, dribblings. When they're not going to the bathroom, they just constantly have urinary incontinence. And then you also have urgency, nocturia, increased frequency. That's VPH. Um, so for this, when a person, when you do a rectal examination, a digital rectal examination, so you are checking them from the rectum, you're putting your fingers in, you would notice that the area is firm. So he the doctor described firm as in like, if you touch your nose, that's where firm is. 
So this is the type of feeling you would feel once you would um, do a digital rectal examination. Now, in the case of prostatic cancer, when you do a digital rectal examination, it would feel stony hard. It would feel very, very hard, not firm, not like your nose, but much harder. In the case of prostatitis, which is inflammation of the prostate gland, you would notice that it feels soft and rubbery, and he described it as feeling um, like your earlobe. So um, that covers the majority of our clinical cases. And now we welcome you to the um, Shibuya arc. I'm not going to get into what that is, but essentially what I mean is that we're now going to solve some questions. So how I'd recommend going about this is that I show the question, you can pause the session for a bit and then answer, and then I'll just give an explanation and the answers. So during a vasectomy, the ductus deferens is ligated. And it's ligated in the superior part of the scrotum. One year following this procedure, the subsequent ejaculation, um, the subsequent ejaculate contains what? So this reminds me that I forgot to mention what a vasectomy is, but essentially, um, here is our vast reference as it's going up, right? And they're going up from um, both right and left. Um, so vasectomy or tummy, tummy again means cutting up something. So you're essentially cutting the vast reference. So you're only cutting the vast reference. You're not cutting the ampulla of the vast reference or the, um, the ejaculatory duct. You're cutting up the vast deference. That's what this means. So in the case when you're doing a vast deference, uh, vasectomy, what would the ejaculatory material now contain given that material is, not, is no longer passing through the vas deferens into the prostate? So you have prostatic fluid only, seminal fluid and prostatic fluid, sperm only, sperm and seminal fluid, or sperm, seminal fluid, and prostatic fluid. And now I'll move on to the answer. The answer is seminal fluid and prostatic fluid. So essentially, um, I was trying to give the hint here, but essentially um, you're only ligating the vas deferens. You're not ligating the uh, seminal vesicle duct. You're not ligating um, the prostate itself. So prostatic fluid, which is coming from the prostate itself and it's going directly into the urethra will not be affected. So it's gonna be there for sure. Seminal fluid will also still be there because it's not reliant on the vas deferens. It can still pass through. All you're doing is stopping sperms from entering the uh, uh, urethra through the vas deferens because you're just cutting it. And that's pretty much it. Okay, next question. A six-year-old boy is admitted to the hospital because of a palpable mass located external to the aponeurosis of the external oblique. Okay. Radiographic examination reveals that the mass is an ectopic testis classified as interstitial. So that's what well, you need to know is ectopic testis. Failure of normal development of which of the following embryological structures is responsible for ectopic testis. So again, remember that ectopic testis means something that's not in its normal descent pathway at all. So then think about it and we move forward. And the answer is gubernaculum. So remember the gubernaculum is a structure that's marking the pathway for the descent of the testis, right? So if that initial marker is gone, or if it's not working correctly, then you can very well assume that the testes are gonna be in a uh, topic or they're not gonna be in their normal position at all. That's pretty simple, this one. Next, while performing avoiding cystic urethrogram on a 43 year old man, the urology resident was too forced when he inserted the catheter and accidentally damaged the wall of the membranous portion of the urethra in the deep perineal compartment or the urogenital dive. Which of the following structures would most likely be traumatized at this location? Okay, so think about it for a second. Do you think it's the bulbospongiosis muscle, sphincter urethra, the corpus cavernosus, ischial cavernosus, or opening of the bulbourethral duct? Again, what they're asking is that they have damaged the membranous portion of the urethra. Which of the following structures would also be traumatized at this location? So from these answers. What do you think it is? And as you're thinking, we'll move on forward. And the answer would be the sphincter urethra. Remember that the membranous part of the um, membranous part of the urethra is directly linked to the um, external urethral sphincter. 
Remember that between the bladder and the prostate, you have the internal, and between the prostate and the membranous part, you have the external sphincter. So sphincter urethra is another word that the use to refer to the external sphincter. And that is the most likely answer of what could be damaged at this location, as we haven't done the rest of these anyway. Moving onwards, a 15-year-old boy is admitted to the emergency department of two days, um, two days after crashing his bicycle. Uh, MRI examination reveals severe edema of the boy's scrotum and abdominal wall. Uh, and extra, uh, they reveal that they had, um, sorry, severe edema of the boy's scrotum and abdominal wall. And they also noticed that there was extravasated urine. Which of the following structures is most likely ruptured? Don't think too much into the wording of these. Again, think simply. Look here as well. And as you're thinking, we're going to move forward. Which structure was most likely ruptured? We have the spongy urethra. So again, this is an example of straddle injury. You're, when you're sitting on a bike, look at the way he's sitting. He is straddling the uh, the bike's sitting seat, right? Um, so this could result in your bulbar uh, part of the spongy urethra being damaged in case of trauma. Next question. A 54-year-old man is admitted to the hospital with severe back pain. Upon radiographic examination, this, uh, the scrotum resembled a bag of worms. Which of the following conditions would most likely be associated with this radiographic picture, which is shown here? Varicocele, rectocele, cystocele, hydrocele, or hypospadias? As you're thinking, the answer is varicocele. We know classically, bag of worms is used to refer to a varicocele. Um, next question. A 25-year-old man is admitted to the hospital with testicular pain. Physical examination revealed a swollen and inflamed right testis. A CT scan examination revealed abnormal accumulation of fluid in the cavity of the tunica vaginalis. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis for this patient? Varicocele, rectocele, cystocele, hydrocele, or hypospadias? Pause, think. The answer is hydrocele. If you may remember, keywords, tunica vaginalis, fluid accumulated in its cavity. The first thing you should think of is hydrocele immediately, not varicocele. Do not confuse it with varicocele, which is, again, bag of worms, distended veins. Last question. A 35-year-old man is admitted to the hospital after being kicked in the groin while playing football. During physical examination, it is noted that the left testicle of the patient is swollen. MRI examination revealed coagulation of blood in the veins draining the testis. And to which of the following veins would a thrombus most likely pass first from the injured area? So they said left testicle was um, hit while playing football. From this, they noticed that the veins draining the testis were coagulated. They had coagulation. So what vein would first be um, affected, like which one would a thrombus pass into first? Think and think. And finally, left renal vein. As you remember, right testicular vein drained directly into the inferior vena cava, but left renal vein, oh, sorry, the left testicular vein would drain into the left renal vein first and then the inferior vena cava. The rest of these are not involved in testicular um, drainage. And inferior vena cava can't be the answer because first it has to go into the left renal vein. With that, we mark the end of this PAL session. Thank you so much for attending or watching the recording, I guess. Um, if you have any questions or any feedback, do let me know. Um, we'd also appreciate if you could do that by scanning the code shown here. And yeah, thank you so much. And I hope you have a lovely day or night.